The problem gives an expression in terms of a positive integer in and establishes a condition that the expression evaluates to an integer. Our task is to prove that if this condition holds, the integer result must be a perfect square. Our first step is to analyze the initial condition. What does it imply about the term inside the square root? Let the integer value of the expression be k. To understand the structure of n, we must first isolate the square root term. Subtracting 2 from both sides yields the equation k minus 2 equals 2 times the square root of the quantity, 28 and squared, plus 1. Next, we divide by 2 to isolate the radical completely. Dividing by 2 isolates the radical. We now have the square root of 28 and squared plus 1 equals the quantity k minus 2 divided by 2. Since k is an integer, the right-hand side of this equation is a rational number. This implies that the square root on the left must also be rational. This relies on a fundamental lemma of number theory, which we will now prove. If the square root of an integer m is a rational number, it must be an integer. To begin the proof, we represent the square root of m as a fraction, p over q, which is in lowest terms. This means p and q share no common factors. Squaring both sides gives m times q squared equals p squared. This relationship implies that q squared must divide p squared. A key property of prime factorization means that q must therefore divide p. However, our initial assumption was that p and q are coprime. The only way q can divide p under this condition is if q is equal to 1. This proves the lemma. Applying our proven lemma, because the square root of 28 and squared plus 1 is rational, it must be an integer. This implies that the expression inside the square root, 28 and squared plus 1, must be a perfect square. Let's call it y squared for some integer y. Rearranging this equation will reveal its underlying structure. The result is a form of Pell's equation. The problem is now reduced to finding integer solutions, y and n, that satisfy this relation. Now, let's use this new insight to restate our original goal in simpler terms. Let's return to the original expression we need to analyze. We've established that 28 and squared plus 1 is a perfect square, which we called y squared. It's important to note that y is positive since it's the positive square root of a positive number. We can now substitute y squared into the expression. The square root of y squared simplifies to y, since y must be positive. The expression simplifies to 2 plus 2y. Thus, our goal has been reframed. We must show that 2 plus 2y is a perfect square, given the constraint from the Pell's equation. Progress can be made by factoring the Pell's equation. We start by isolating the terms involving y. The left side is a difference of squares, which can be factored. This gives the product of y minus 1, and y plus 1 equals 28 times n squared. Notice that our target expression 2 plus 2y can be written as 2 times the quantity y plus 1. This connects our goal directly to this factorization. Now, we will analyze the properties of the factors y minus 1 and y plus 1. From our condition, 28 and squared is even, so 28 and squared plus 1 must be odd. Since y squared is odd, y itself must also be an odd integer. This means that y minus 1 and y plus 1 are consecutive even integers. The greatest common divisor of any two consecutive even integers is exactly 2. Let's return to our factored equation. Since y minus 1 and y plus 1 are both even, we can divide the entire equation by 4. This yields the product of the quantity y minus 1 over 2 and the quantity y plus 1 over 2 equals 7 times n squared. Let's call these factors a and b. They are integers because y is odd. We need to prove that these two integers are coprime. If a number d divides both a and b, then it must also divide their difference. The difference between b and a is exactly 1. The only positive integer that divides 1 is 1 itself. Therefore, the greatest common divisor of a and b must be 1. 
Consequently, these two factors, A and EB, are co-prime. This coprimality is the crucial insight. It strictly dictates how the prime factors on the right-hand side can be distributed between A and B. The coprimality of A and B allows us to determine their structure by analyzing the prime factors of the right-hand side. We have two coprime factors, A and B, whose product is seven times n squared. This structure significantly constrains their possible forms. To determine the forms of A and B, we will analyze the prime factors of their product. Consider any prime number P that is not 7. In the term 7 and squared, the exponent of P must be even. Because A and B are coprime, they share no prime factors. Thus, this entire even power of P must belong either to A or to B. This holds for all primes except 7. Therefore, the prime factorization of both A and B must consist of even exponents, except for the prime 7. Now consider the prime 7. Its exponent in 7 and squared is odd, at least 1. Again, since A and B are coprime, this entire odd power of 7 must belong to only one of them. This leads to an exhaustive conclusion. One factor must be a perfect square, and the other must be 7 times a perfect square. This gives two mutually exclusive possibilities. Case 1, where a is 7 times u squared and b is v squared, or case 2, where a is u squared and b is 7 times v squared. We also know that b minus a is equal to 1. Let's examine case 2. Substituting into the difference equation gives 7v squared minus u squared equals 1. To rewrite this in a standard Pell's form, we can multiply the equation by negative 1. This gives u squared minus 7v. Squared equals negative 1. We can test the solvability of this equation using modular arithmetic, specifically by considering it modulo 7. The equation reduces to u squared is congruent to negative 1, modulo 7. Let's examine the possible values of a perfect square modulo 7. 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, and 3 squared is 9, which is congruent to 2. The set of quadratic residues modulo 7 is therefore 0, 1, 2, and 4. Negative 1 is congruent to 6 modulo 7, which is not in the set of quadratic residues. Consequently, this equation has no integer solutions. This demonstrates that case 2 is impossible. With case 2 eliminated, case 1 must be true. This provides the final step of the proof. We conclude that b, which is the quantity y plus 1 over 2, must be a perfect square v squared. Let's return to our simplified expression 2 plus 2y. Factoring out a 2 is the next logical step. This gives 2 times the quantity y plus 1. From our conclusion in case 1, we know that y plus 1 is equal to 2 times v squared. Substituting this into our expression yields 2 times the quantity 2v squared. This expression simplifies directly. The result is 4v squared, which is the square of 2v. As v is an integer, the proof is complete. We have therefore shown that the original expression must be the square of an integer. To make the proof concrete, we will find the smallest positive integer and that satisfies the initial condition and verify our result. The condition from case 1 was that v squared minus 7u squared equals 1. This is a Pell's equation. To find its fundamental solution, we can test small integer values for u. If u is 1, v squared equals 8, which is not a perfect square. If u is 2, v squared equals 29, also not a perfect square. If u is 3, v squared equals 64. This gives an integer solution, v equals 8. Checking the solution, 8 squared minus 7 times. 3 squared is 1. The solution is correct. Therefore, the smallest positive integer solution is v, u, equals 8, 3. From our earlier definition, n is the product of u and v, which is 24. 
Now we substitute an equals 24 into the original expression. First, we evaluate 24 squared. This is 576. Next, we multiply by 28. The product is 16,128. Adding 1. Ani gives 16,129. As predicted by our proof, this number must be a perfect square. Its square root is 127. The expression becomes 2 plus 2 times 127. This evaluates to 256. And 256 is 16 squared, confirming our result. Our derivation also predicted this result. The final value should be the square of 2v, which in this case is the square of 2 times 8, or 16 squared. The theory is consistent with the example. Let's reflect on the path we took to this solution. The problem began with a condition on an integer. Analysis of this condition revealed an underlying Pell's equation, whose structure was determined completely by prime factorization and modular arithmetic. This demonstrates how uncovering a problem's hidden algebraic structure is often the key to its solution.